everyone, Brian Beeler coming to you with the Storage Review Podcast, and we've got one that's quite literally about to be out of this world this week. We've done lots of podcasts about edge computing. Uh, we've looked at the wetlands in Canada. We've looked at the British Antarctic Survey. Um, and this one is going to be a little bit more remote when it comes to edge computing. So I'd like to uh, welcome in Mark Fernandez with HPE. Mark, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is pretty exciting times. Yeah, I know you're right in the middle of it. So what goes down in four days? <laughs> uh, Spaceborne Computer 2 will be launched aboard uh, Northrop Grumman's 15th uh, cargo resupply service up to the International Space Station. Among the thousands of pounds of cargo is going to be HPE Spaceborne Computer 2. And we're super excited about bringing, as you said, uh, state-of-the-art edge computing uh, above the clouds. So walk us through this whole thing. This is Space Computer 2. Space Computer 1 has already been in service and was uh, bringing some compute power to the ISS for almost two years, right? So what? T take a step back and give us a little bit of the history. Sure. So... I think you've got a pretty technical audience, so they can probably relate to the, how most uh, HPC systems or other large computer systems are installed in your data center, et cetera. There will first be a, a phase when it is shipped in, and the sysadmins and the facilities folks and others are, are get busy, and they're very excited about it. Uh, they get it up and running, and they have a, a burn-in period, if you would. They make sure everything is working, mm -hmm. uh, that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. And uh, then they hold their breath and allow users on board, <laughs> right, uh, and hope for the best. So Spaceborne Computer 1 is that first phase. Uh, no one thought that we could do uh, any of the three of our missions. Uh, number one is, could you take uh, state-of-the-art, commercial off-the-shelf, enterprise-quality hardware and package it up onto a rocket and have it survive the shake, rattle, and roll of the launch? And number two, could the non-IT folks called astronauts uh, install it into a, a non-standard computer rack that the ISS racks on board where all sorts of experiments are mounted. And number three, would it work at all and survive? So as you know, we survived uh, 1.8 years. It was a one-year nominal mission. We ran, as you would uh, during any acceptance period, uh, standard international uh, benchmarks to ring out the processors, ring out the memory, ring out the storage, ring out the network and, and rinse and repeat and see how long it would run before we ran into issues. Uh, and as we do here on Earth, when we're pretty confident, you'll let your special friends on board, right? You'll have <laughs> early access early access users. And so we had an early access user from NASA Langley uh, and they were quite successful. So now Spaceborne 2 is going back up, and it's not for us. It is for the users. And uh, we have nothing planned for it other than our health checks and, and monitoring the health of the system. Uh, and it's we're opening it up for the community to test edge computing at the edge of the edge. And how can that benefit uh, space exploration and humanity here on Earth? I don't know. I feel like they're just going to play Fortnite on it. <laughs> I get asked if we're going to mine bitcoins. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Minecraft server bitcoins, uh, right. Fortnite, right. whatever. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I hear they get a little bored up there sometimes after uh, doing all their real work and preferred you know, to be able to stream some movies or something, but, you know, giving them access to a, a supercomputer in space might uh, yeah. come up with some interesting use cases. Well, this is a, a server, right? It's a, it's a supercomputer. It's edge computing. There's no keyboard, mouse, or monitor. So it's mm -hmm. there to crunch your numbers, process your images, uh, pre-process your data, etc. So it's there to do that type of stuff at the edge that we typically do down here as well. So what did you learn then from the, the first effort? Obviously, you've got 1.8 years. 
What yeah. did you learn from the hardware standpoint that you've that you've included in this Gen Two model? Was there something you know, mm. unexpected that that once you got the exposure up there that you that you figured out? Uh, yeah, we. If you got time, we learn we learn four things. We've got all sorts of time. All right. <laughs> Uh, and some of them are good stories and some of them are bad stories. So the first one has to do with the electrical power. Uh, we took commercial off the shelf enterprise quality servers here in the United States and shipped them up to the U S module of the international space station. And we sent them with 110 volt AC connectors, standard supported. We shipped them all over the United States, et cetera. The ISS, runs on DC power and its source is the solar sails. So they provide an inverter and it takes the, depending on which module you're in, in the American module it takes that DC power and converts it to 110 volt AC for America and they do something different on the Japanese module and they do something different on the Russian module. Well those turned out to not be that reliable <clears throat> but we said wait a minute our servers that we manufacture here on Earth have DC support built into them. And, and we sell those to telcos and others that, that run DC right up to them. So the first major hardware change is that we're going to be DC powered with standard supported DC power supplies that, that anyone here on Earth can pick up. So that's going to be exciting. It's going to take out uh, one week link one less part to fail and cause us issues. It's going to increase our power efficiency uh, because we don't have the power losses going through the inverter, et cetera. Okay. Uh, the second hardware change is kind of interesting and it's sort of strange for the, the data centers down here, folks, to think about it. Uh, Spaceborne 1 and Spaceborne 2 have a rear water cool door on them, just as you would at a, at a data center down here with standard airflow through the servers with a rear water-cooled heat exchanger. And typically we're at data centers we're crunched for space, so we put that heat exchanger as close to the server as possible and, and parallel to the back. Well, it turns out the racks on the space station are a little bit wider than the racks here on Earth are deep. And so we can tilt that heat exchanger at an angle and expose more of the cooling fins uh, to the heat. So we're going to increase our heat efficiency out to the water. So that's a second hardware change, if you would. Mm -hmm. um, the third one may be of interest to, to, your, to your audience. The third one may be of interest to your audience since your, your storage review. We had uh, an unexpectedly high failure rate of solid state disk in Spaceborne 1. So our plan was for Spaceborne 2 to send up more than one SSD type technology and compare and contrast their performance and reliability. Well then COVID hit and SSDs were in short supply globally. Uh, we were fortunate enough to fully populate our servers with SSDs, but they are, again, all the same type that we were able to acquire. However, uh, this time we are going to add uh, an HPE hardware RAID into a couple of servers. The other servers are going to do a software RAID, and just like we did in Spaceborne 2, we're going to have multiple copies of the data on different servers and on different physical devices to help preserve our users uh, precious data. So um, there was another one there. Uh, yeah, this one is kind of interesting and we'll see if it pans out. With Space One One, it was a one year mission and we did not build serviceability into the locker that into which the servers are placed. So it would have been difficult for the astronauts to replace any parts. With Spaceborne 2, we are having a hinged front door and the servers are on slide out trays. 
The idea is that over a two to three year mission, we may in fact need them to replace a hot swappable fan or uh, a redundant power supply. So we're sending up what we would typically send to a data center, two to three years of spare parts. Mm -hmm. And we're working on the instructions and we call them astronaut replaceable unit instructions. <laughs> okay. So things have to be done differently uh, when there's zero G. We experienced that in uh, Spaceborne One. Uh, we asked NASA to review our uh, replaceable unit instructions for the hot swappable power supply, and it was totally inadequate if you had zero G. So uh, it grew in the number of pages. <laughs> <laughs> The steps are much more precisely described and uh, carefully articulated. So we have that one squared away and we're working on others in case we need them. Well, that's funny because you take something like serviceability of a server for granted, right? Because, I mean, you talk about swapping out a fan. So what do you do? You walk up to it, you pull it out, you pop the lid, you grab the fan, you throw it away, you put the new one in, put it back together. It's a... 30 second operation uh, if you know what you're doing right right uh, the fact that you have to re-architect that i mean it makes sense that you would have to but the, for for space and zero g is is pretty remarkable um go back to the uh, the ssd conversation though because that one's really interesting to me did you were you able to attribute a cause as to why you were having more failure with ssds does it have i mean anything to do with magnetism or like what's going on there that that would cause that so you you brought up my second level disappointment uh due primarily to covid we had plans to do what we call a product failure analysis mm -hmm. and we were going to do a double blind study we were going to send out to all of our suppliers uh a good component from our earth ground station a good component from space and a questionable or failed component from space and tell them all three of them failed and, and please tell us why. So we had uh, good SSDs on the ground, we had good SSDs in space and we had failed SSDs in space. <clears throat> Again, due to COVID, um, things just didn't happen. So we were forced to make the decision to, to forge ahead uh, as we did with Space Form 1. So I, we don't have any data to share on why any of the components that failed or caused issues in Space Portal 1, the, the origin of them. That brings me to a second point. <clears throat> we are taking a different design criteria and it's called consequential design. So instead of a preventative design, which is radiation hardening, uh, in which you attempt to prevent the radiation that you think might be there mm -hmm. from damaging your electronics <clears throat> uh, and so that takes time and money etc so the the processors that the ISS uh, was first sent up to in 1998 uh, were built in 1985 so it took that long to get them through the hardening process there's a different process called consequential and not being a radiation guy I'm not passionate about determining what type of radiation might be there and what might its intensity be. I'm concerned about the consequences of something happening. If I lose this SSD, what do I do? If I have high error rates on these DIMMs, what do I do? I don't care the source of the failure. It could be a default of manufacturing. It could be radiation. It could be yesterday's solar flare. So we've built up a a uh, fault table, a two-dimensional fault table. If if this parameter falls out of range, this is my first step. If it continues out of range, here's my second step, etc. Uh, the the philosophy is we'd rather run full speed than slow speed. Uh, I'd rather run slow speed than idle. I'd rather be idle than powered down. I'd rather be powered down than damaged. <laughs> so, okay. Right. So, uh, so we've got that stair step, if you would, of preventative measures, 
and we call it hardening with software. Uh, and it proved itself in Spaceborne 1, and we've augmented it uh, for Spaceborne 2. We've added another layer, and it is uh, right off of HPE's product line. They have a product called Service Guard for Linux, and okay. it is application level HA. So I'm doing the most I can in terms of saving the hardware, saving the software, saving your data, et cetera. But if your application needs to be high availability, we can apply that just to your application, not to the whole system and not to everybody all the time, et cetera. So that's a pretty exciting option that we're going to make available to the user community. Interesting. So you've touched on a lot of things there, and I want to, I want to dive into uh, to many mm -hmm. of them. But take, take me back a step in your trajectory, because you've been in HPC for a long time. How did you get involved in in this space portion of it, and how did HPE get involved there? What's what's going on there with that relationship, and why why is this important to HPE? So, that's a great question. I, I love talking about that. So, in 2014, uh, like you say, I've been in HPC large systems uh, for all my career, right? So. One of our largest and longest customers is NASA Ames, and they've got generally uh, one of the largest supercomputers in the world. They've had it since uh, as far back as I can remember. They've been really pioneering. And with the shuttle disasters, they got an additional mission to do modeling and simulation for space flight in order to increase the safety of the shuttle flights and the assembly of the ISS. And that mission continues. Well, in 2014, they came to us and they're quite visionary. They said, when we get to the moon and we get to the Mars, uh, we're not going to be able to do our mission. The latency between here and the moon might be tolerable, but it's certainly not going to be acceptable when we get to Mars. And if you saw the, the movie The Martian, uh, Matt Damon uh, lives and breathes that latency and, and how difficult it is. So they just sort of said, hey, would you take one of the servers out of our supercomputer and see if you can put it on the ISS? And that's what they asked us to do. Uh, and we raised our hand and said, sure, let's try that. <laughs> and that's when we got into the, the, the first three levels of, of ex the experiment where the, the rocket can, you know, can you get it on the rocket and can it survive? And secondly, can you get these guys to install it? You, we, we live this all day, every day, and we take certain things for granted, and we had to rethink a lot of those things. So uh, what is HPE getting out of it? Uh, we want to show the value of edge computing, and as one of our customers and partners said, if you can run it on the ISS, I can run it anywhere on Earth. <laughs> right. well, that's, a, that's, that's a pretty big hurdle. So yeah, I suppose if you're running it up there, then, uh, then you're all you're all good. Um, and I know HPE's, you know, always driving and, and, and trying to come up with these new solutions. So as you get these solutions into space, mm -hmm. can you learn something there that's practical back on Earth? Yes. So we've got seven patent submissions uh, underway related to the hardening with software umbrella. And uh, that may have applicability here on Earth, where you've got size, weight, and uh, electrical needs that you can't meet with a traditional way of protecting items. And so this software level may be able to help you. That's one of them. Uh, when we get the product failure analysis done, hopefully sometime this year, that may tell us a little bit more about how we might need to change the technology, et cetera. Uh, we've already discovered a certain way that some wires were soldered to the fans, and hmm. we don't do that way anymore. So, interesting. Uh, yeah, that was that was rather interesting. All of the servers from space and Spaceborne One uh, showed this anomaly. None of them sitting in the lab in Chippewa Falls did. 
they weren't moving around at 17,500 miles an hour and <laughs> didn't, didn't have those harmonic frequencies that are present on the ISS, etc. And so uh, that was revealed. That was kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, to your point before, there's so much that goes on there that you can plan for, that you can think about. If you're running hard drives up there, you're thinking about vibration, and you're thinking about all these other thermals and and even humidity with uh, electronic components. You've got all this stuff, and then you throw it up there, and then you realize, okay, well, what are the other things that we didn't know that we didn't know, right, and, and that is now abusing these systems? Um yeah, I've got the uh, the slide pulled up, so I'm looking at the spec of uh, of Computer Two and 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 what you guys have got put together here. We can talk through that in a little bit more detail, but um, it's a it's a pretty robust setup for for this little thing. And um, thank looks, you. <laughs> looks like it'll be able to drive uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, activity. You talked about some of the software stuff, some of the hardening that you've done there. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about the problems in one with Flash, but walk us through what you've got here from a from a high level spec perspective, and what's actually in this computer. Right. So, uh, as you've mentioned, my my career has been high performance computing, and and that's what got us into this in 2014. And in 2014, uh, edge computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning were were in their infancy. Uh, GPUs were coming up primarily to do graphics and games, etc. Uh, but today they are an incredibly important part of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So part of Space One Computer 2 sticks to that tradition. We've got uh, two socket x86 for number crunching, serious number crunching, modeling and simulation, etc. And and for those apps and scientists that, that haven't moved yet to GPU or their workload is not amenable to GPU. But we're also augmenting Spaceborne Computer 2 with uh, state-of-the-art GPU computing and making that available. Uh, we've already got some DNA sequencing planned, some image processing planned, some signal processing planned uh, to make use of that new technology of a GPU on board. Uh, you've seen the complement of storage that I've got there. Uh, what may seem okay, so-so uh, in that list is 10 gig Ethernet. We're bringing up 10 gig Ethernet because most of the experiments that go up there that are built today have a natural 10 gig E built into them, but the ISS does not support 10 gig E. It's still a 1 gig local area network. so. We're shipping up a relatively long Cat 6 in gig e cable, and uh, if there's a sufficient need, we'll plug directly into your camera, directly into your sensor or, or your experiment, etc., and uh, be able to suck that data in 10 times faster than you could get it to the device that's going to send it to Earth, and then we'll process it tens to hundreds of times faster in space and then be able to get you your results uh, much faster. So I, I'm calling it sample to insight, uh, and, and we're going to increase that uh, turnaround time. So we're going to drastically reduce that. How long is that manual to uh, plug in the, the 10 gig cable between a, a, a device and the, and the HPC cluster? Is that a 50 page <laughs> manual? No, it's not. Uh, we're going to have to have a need for it, and you have to schedule the astronauts' time. But but we're ready for it if there's a need. So Gosh, that's that's got to be a bear. So you know, it, it's interesting. I was thinking initially more about the astronauts working directly with the the supercomputer, but it, it's it's not really. It's it's yeah. people on Earth that are that are accessing it, and and the sensors and all the stuff that's in space that's being collected and analyzed by the supercomputer itself, but the um, the uh, the astronauts themselves are just your your field tech support. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. So uh, we want to let them do what they do, and uh, we're out there to help accelerate that sample to insight for all the other experiments that are waiting for the bottleneck to get their data down to Earth. So I'm yeah, pretty excited. It's... 
Yeah, it, it's the same problem though that you just you just stated in space that that exists at the edge, whether it's smart cities or factory floor or whatever, where you've got all this data, all this activity happening at the edge, and you've got um, IT on hand to help analyze that. And if you get really fancy, you slap some GPUs or FPGAs or whatever. And now mm -hmm. we can start doing a lot of analytics, especially around video surveillance and all sorts of other topics. But mm -hmm. we don't need to send all of that data back to the data center every time. I mean, sometimes you do and, and sometimes not. Sometimes you just want the insight to see if you can get some more actionable. And so you you have an extreme version of the problem, right? Where a remote factory might have a, a low quality pipe back to the data center. You've got the mm -hmm. lowest quality of pipe, that, <laughs> right. right? So what? Right. Talk about the the I/O challenge. So you you get the computer up there, you're doing the work, you do the analysis. We figured out how to do the the uh, on site support with an astronaut, uh, but the communications is still your your Achilles heel, isn't it? Yeah, correct. So for for people to relate to to what I'm. I'm doing up in space, I, I tell them, how about that person that just went out and bought a 5G phone and realized that they don't have 5G coverage, <laughs> right? So you're sending out sensors with 10 giggies on board and, and they get plugged into a one gig that's 20 years old, et cetera. So um, I have 50 gigabytes per second in my house. I have two megabits a second coming down from the ISS. So we've done a lot of work in uh, encoding and encapsulating our status files, our health check files, and plan to apply our general purpose computer science uh, ability to do that to help out all these other scientists that, that aren't aware of this problem until they, they get up there. Uh, one example that we've been through is um, hundreds of gigabytes of data. We processed it on the ground stations and got it down to four to five gigabytes. Mm. And that was just a tremendous 20x, if you would, improvement. In the, and the scientist was so excited that instead of having to wait for his hundreds of gigabytes to come down, he could relay stuff to Spaceborne Computer uh, get it down to four gigs and wait for his four gigs. And I said, okay, great. And I said, what are you going to do with that four gig when you get it? Well, I'm going to run the so-and-so program. And I said, well, give it to me. And so he did. <laughs> and and I, I, I went from hundreds of gig to four gig down to a couple of hundred K. Wow. And, and then I can compress that hundred K and get it down to him in five seconds. So I, you know, once we have a couple of documented examples out there, I, I think the community is going to realize that this is really uh, supercharging your science. The ability to, A, process the raw data uh, at the edge, at your sensor, at your experiment. And then, so we've, we've pre-processed it. And then if your processing that you're interested in is running on Linux, I could go ahead and do that for you as well. And that usually shrinks things down even further and then gets you the answers uh, if you want that. And taking it even a step further, uh, if there's a go, no go or, or something that's interesting or not interesting and you've got that qualifying software, uh, I can do those qualifications for you and then send you the data and send you an email saying, OK, time to go to work. Uh, and <laughs> Instead of you having to look through all the data as it has eventually trickled down. So it's, it is edge computing on steroids as to what we're going to be able to do. Well, it sounds like you're doing a lot of education, though, too, of the scientists to help them understand how to ask and refine their questions, right? So yeah. how... Are these guys used, I mean, they're used to working in the HPC world. How much training do they need, though, to work on space HPC and understanding the limitations there? It sounds like you're doing a lot of uh, education there or support there to help these guys along. Yeah, so that's the, that's the fun part. Part of me is a teacher, part of me is a computer scientist, and, and for my career, I've, 
I've never wanted to wave my flag. I, I want to enable other scientists to, to do their job better, right? So you touched upon something. It, it is actually written in our agreement with the ISS National Lab that we will focus on the space research community with outreach, support, and training and the use of onboard processing. So uh, in, in my little world, the way we do that is we have a test and development system outside the NASA HPE firewall, and it is the identical hardware and software setup that we have on space. And we give, we're going to give our partners a lo username and login. You get your code over there. When you think it's perfect, right, when you think it's working just fine, uh, give me a copy and a test plan. And I will be your beta tester of not only your instructions on how to operate it, but on your software. And if, if your software runs and I get through the instructions without any errors and you get the answers back the way you want, then I will put that on the ISS and make your runs on your behalf and get you your answers back. So they, they get to learn how to use something remotely, but it's uh, much higher speed and you've got some help here, humans on earth to help you, et cetera, till you get it all squared away. And then we put it into production on the space station. So you talked a little bit about, um, about what some of these experiments devices they can connect with and, and things that they can do. Is there anything or a couple examples you could point to that are kind of neat about the research that's going on up there specifically? I know you, know, you probably can't comment on, on some of them, but you know, what, what can you tell us about use cases to, to further uh, help us understand that? Sure, sure. So the, the ones we use are, are typically three, and, and one is a, a lightning strike study. And uh, again, I'm not the lightning guy, so I'm kind of making this up, but uh, you've got a ultra high def multi-spectral camera and it's studying lightning and generating tons of data. But say you only want the 10 seconds before the lightning strike and the 10 seconds after the lightning strike, and you've been having to send all of that data back down to earth, and then you run a routine that has artificial intelligence, machine learning built into it that can identify a lightning strike and then subset that video to that 20 second slice and then you go to work. Well, I can do that and save you tons of bandwidth and tons of time. Uh, another one related to the, the global climate issues is polar ice observations. And there are sensors up there that are doing wonderful uh, estimates of the polar ice thickness, its location, etc. But they don't work if there's cloud cover. So they have a routine that they can run their video or their data feed through that determines if cloud cover is present and we shouldn't use this data because it'd be questionable. So again, I can filter that out for you. Uh, those I call looking outside the ISS, looking toward Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, one that, that people can relate to inside is Matt Damon goes to eat his potato for dinner, <laughs> right? And he notices some mold on it. And he says, uh, can I, is this thing safe to eat? Well, there may be a photographic database of molds that are good for you and bad for you on the potatoes. And he, he, he may want to run that through Spaceborne Computer to determine if that's good or bad. He may have a DNA sequencer and he may want to sequence that mold, uh, do a rapid sequence and then analyze that DNA sequencing on Spaceborne Computer 2 to determine what that actual mold is before he turns around and makes his mashed potatoes. So those type things are of interest to us. Well, yeah, and that's just what you've got now with Spaceborn 2. You've got to be thinking already about what's next, not necessarily three, but I mean, if, <laughs> right. if we're going to use the moon to launch to Mars or whatever, I mean, all these places are going to need data centers of some degree or another, whether it's a a couple systems or something more ambitious. Have you put much thought into, I'm sure you have, because you, you sound like you're obviously into it. You're, um, but like, what do you, how do you think about a, a lunar data center? 
So, yeah, right now I'm focused on the launch Saturday. Yeah, I know, I know. I, Four days from then, then you can focus on the Lunar Data Center. Right. So, <laughs> um, actually, you know, I'm, I'm a Star Trek fan. And this may seem far-fetched, but they are closely linked. Uh, we've been in contact with several agencies and other partners that are helping us try to get to the moon and Mars in what they call autonomous mission operations, AMO. And uh, psychologists and psychiatrists have stated that if you're on a three-year trip to Mars and every morning you got to go check the so-and-so filter in Rack 3, and then you've got to go read this gauge, and then you've got to go this, that you're going to go bonkers. So that's what we have now. We, we have things in the spacecraft that have to be manually monitored. And if we can automate that, then those signals could come into Spaceborne Computer 2, and just like on Star Trek, you know, your things are going along fine. An alarm goes off and says, we need to go check filter three in rack seven. And so um, they don't have to mess with it uh, until we raise the alert. And the fact that we're already using the, that range of valid numbers, valid values for hardening with software can be applied to any sensor data, whether it's part of Space Foreign Computer 2 or Spark part of the spacecraft. So uh, we have a good, nice fit there, if you would, on helping the mission. And so that's what I'm looking at, places that uh, general purpose enterprise class servers can help with the automation of spaceflight. We're doing that here on Earth with factories, right, and, and oil rigs and mines and automobiles, et cetera. So it's a natural outgrowth that we would have part of that as Spaceborne 3, if you would. Okay. By the way, have you put in your application yet on for that uh, St. Jude ride on... Uh... <laughs> on the SpaceX trip? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you were probably in the first day, weren't you? Yeah, I, there's no hope, but I like doing it. Behind me is this is my ticket to Mars. So <laughs> you can uh, submit to have your name uh, sent on the next rover to mars and and uh, so i've done that that's pretty exciting <laughs> but not your actual person huh no yeah that's uh that, that's a that's a long ride um all right so we've talked a little bit about it the launch is coming up in a few days walk walk me through the process of getting getting this on and certified and how does that work to get the payload up there and then once it's there what's the plan to get it operational ah so there is a, a step, and it's called turnover. And once you achieve turnover, you have literally turned over your payload to NASA, and all they're going to do is package it up and put it on a rocket to fly. So we achieved turnover back in November. To get to turnover, we had 186 requirements that we had to address. And uh, it took us... Well, let me back up. Spaceborne 1 splashed down in June of 2019, and we got the signed agreement to do Spaceborne 2 in October of 2019, which is an incredibly short period of time, which indicates our enthusiasm and NASA's agreement, et cetera, to, to move forward. I had high hopes that we would achieve turnover in 12 months, which would be near record setting turnover for a payload. Uh, with COVID, we got some delays, et cetera, but so we did it in 13 months. So met all those 186 aspects. So once you have turnover, then you launch. After the spacecraft has docked with the International Space Station, uh, there will be a planning meeting on who gets unloaded, when, where, and how. And, and so everybody makes their case as to why they get to be unloaded first. Uh, <laughs> I've got to feed my rats, I've got to water my lettuce, etc. So sure. uh, we'll be in the mix there. 
So this goes back to the scheduling issue then of getting the time with the astronauts. So, so Spaceborne Computer One is already gone. Is this slotting right back into where that guy was, or or is it a different? How much rack space is even up there in the first place? I think I don't know the total number of racks, but I want to say there's 24 racks up there uh, okay. in in the U.S. National Lab. Um, we were in Express Rack Six the first time. And it's in the ceiling, so that's, <laughs> that's another fascinating tidbit. Uh, we're in Express Rack 10 now. Uh, okay. that's, our, that's our plan. Um, and it's really first available. They're all pretty much equivalent. So... Is, the, is this any more dense in terms of rack units, or is this bigger? What are we, from a space consumption, what are you looking at here? Uh, it's... It's almost the identical outward dimensions. The, the locker is made to fit into the ISS rack. And then inside the locker, we fit the servers, etc. So we've got a, a little miniature 19-inch rack, uh, standard 19-inch rack for Spaceborne Computer 2. It was 5U tall, 19-inch rack, etc. Uh, on Spaceborne 2, we've got our standard slide-out shelves that we often use in data centers so the uh so we're sending up two lockers so we have uh twice the physical space twice the number of servers and uh 2.3 x the capabilities so wow. yeah so they'll i'm sure the manual for this one is extensive they'll they'll unpack they'll rack it they'll plug it in what else do they have to do to get operational after that booted obviously but Mm -hmm. Do they, is much else required? I mean, obviously you're pre-configured, you've burned it in, you've already done all the, the, the hardware work and the software as well. Uh, so we've got uh, redundant power to two lockers. So there'll be four power cables that have to be properly plugged in. And each of the cables is labeled and it's got a, a labeled place that it plugs into on the rack. Uh, we've got redundant ether network connections that they'll need to connect and then we've got redundant liquid water cooling and uh, inlets and outlets that will need to be connected so it's a planned hour and a half operation in space which would take maybe 10 minutes here on earth so, <laughs> right hmm. okay and then so it'll come online it'll be all systems go hopefully right yeah and then from there, when are you running your first job on this thing? As soon as possible, right? So uh, we have what's called a two-hour commanding window once a week, and that's when we can actually be logged into the systems and do things. Uh, the rest of the time, it has to be automated. So <clears throat> we've got it fully automated, but our first two-hour window for the first week is going to be used up by that installation pretty sure. much and we will run what we call our health checks and some initial benchmarks and checkouts and others to make things ready to go and then we've got three experiments lined up and we will schedule those over the next uh, one to three weeks and try to get those knocked out and help those folks with their uh, press releases etc to show what kind of cool stuff they've been able to do in the in the first few weeks of spaceborne 2. Yeah, that'd be curious. I'd, uh, if you're uh, if you're up to it, I'd like to see your your test results. I'm curious as to what you can do with that thing and how it uh, how it compares to our, our earthbound uh, computer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the scheduling. I mean, this is such a logistical nightmare to figure out both your your tech support with your astronauts and then with your your scientists. Mm -hmm. So how you talked a little bit about that already, but just time management has got to be just absolutely critical with this because you want to be as efficient as possible. Um, but you can't have people just waiting around for their time. How do you, how do you think about the, the logistical aspects of this? Well, there's a whole department at NASA that manages what they call a timeline of the astronauts. And they, the astronauts work from eight to five just you know it's an eight hour day etc and they wake up in the morning pull up their timeline it tells them what they're going to be doing so payload developers quote unquote have to get on the timeline 
and uh, we're in the queue. They put us on the timeline, and, and we're available when the astronauts are available. So <laughs> <laughs> you're ready, and your uh, your scientists are ready. So do you, you've got a bunch of scientists queued already? Then and yeah, you know, work workload schedule that you want to run. Correct. Yeah, we've. Part of that, like the process I previously alluded to, uh, we've gone through that with uh, three partners. So their software and their test data sets, et cetera, are preloaded on Spaceborne Computer 2, and it should just be fired up and run it, and we'll give them the results right away. So they kind of know what the answers are going to be, and they kind of know how long it's going to take to get them. Uh, we're just waiting to do it in space for real. And so they're pretty psyched. Oh, I would imagine. So what's the projected useful life of, uh, of this computer? Mm. So not only did NASA ask us to provide 2x the compute power and, and give us 2x the rack room and the electricity and the et cetera, they extended our mission by 2x and it's contractually says two to three years and that is the expected mission. The first missions to Mars and back will take two to three years. So they want to see, Spaceborne 1 proved the computer will work right. in last year. Spaceborne 2 says, okay, will it last for an entire Mars mission? Hmm. So we want to fire it up on day one and see if it can help them during the transit to Mars, help them while they're at Mars, and then continue to help them get them back or do we just need to keep it powered off and safe until they get to Mars and it will expect to last for a year? But I'm confident we're going to go two to three years and not have any loss of data or uh, leave anybody hanging. Well, what what stopped or what was the, the break point for Computer One? Well, we had a contract for a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were scheduled to come back home with a completely successful mission. And then the Soviets had a launch failure, like had an abort. Mm -hmm. And that stopped all space flight up and down. There, there was a freeze. And so our mission was naturally extended. We were still running. We we're still allowed to continue to run. And we got to add that uh, early access user that I mentioned. Uh, because we had completed all our contractual mission requirements. So they were very excited for NASA to have that early access user. We took that time, and we got on the first uh, SpaceX flight back home, and it was at 1.8 years. So you never, you didn't break. You you ran that whole time. The only thing right. is you you went through a uh, an exorbitant supply of SSDs, apparently. <laughs> right. So... Yeah, we had uh, zero errors attributed to Spaceborne Computer 2. Now, we had 36 or 37 anomalies that we encountered during that time from network failures to power failures to cooling failures to maintenance, to et cetera, uh, and solid state disk failures, et cetera. But we recovered from them all. The uh, single bit errors in space on our memory were much more than they were on Earth, but we corrected all of them and continued the processing and didn't get a wrong answer and didn't lose any data. So we're pretty excited about that. And those corrections are new DIMMs or new SSDs, or do you use some software to work around that? No, it's software correctable. Yeah, single bit errors are generally corrected by the computer itself. So a double bit error is one that'll cause a system to crash and you lose data, et cetera. We didn't have any double bit errors. Uh, we were able to avoid all of those and keep running. Mm. So you talked about setting up the field kit for replacements of fans, drives, other, other easily or generally easily replaceable mm -hmm. uh, components. Is it your expectation that that bundle lasts the mission length, or would you send supplemental, if you had a couple extra drives fail or whatever, can you send supplemental parts up? Uh, good question. So, yeah, like here on Earth, we send a set of spares to a, a data center that's expected to last the length of their contract. So our hardware guys have sent enough of these spares to last two to three years. Uh, but we've also been 
allow to send up additional parts if needed. Uh, it's just a lot of government paperwork. <laughs> Exactly. You'd rather get it right the first time. Got to well, get it right. Yes. You'd rather have those dang drives not not fail at all. I was looking at the uh, the spec, and you're using um, some low capacity SSDs. I think they're 240 gig. Right. That's that's because of power draw, I assume, and and uh, heat thermals maybe. It was power draw as well as availability at the time. Hmm. So uh, all the large ones, there was no supply globally they were really crunched down during the midst of covid when we had to put them in the servers and begin our 186 tests so mm -hmm. once you select the hardware you start the 186 test and you can't change anything you just have to pass the test and do what you need to pass the test so our hardware was locked down right as uh you know march april time frame right as things were beginning to hit yeah, well, I, this is uh, this is exciting. You must be uh, you're jittering almost at the idea of this launch coming up. Yeah, I'm super super excited. It's a it's a fascinating thing to see. If you've never seen a rocket launch live and in person, I highly encourage everyone to go do that. But to see one go up and and know that you've got something on board is super special. Yeah, that's uh, it's quite the delivery. Is this headed out of uh, Canaveral or somewhere else? We're leaving out of Wallops Island, uh, oh. Northrop Grumman. We're on the Northrop Grumman NG-15, uh, and they launch out of Wallops Island. And that's, I, I know it's on the uh, what, the 20th. What, what time should we tune in and how do we take a look at this thing going up? Uh, tune in about noon Eastern, and the okay. launch is scheduled for 12.36. Eastern, and uh, should be pretty exciting. Well, it sounds like it. I can't. Uh, I'll. We'll be watching. Can't wait to check this thing out and mm -hmm. uh, and see some of the results that you've got coming off of the uh, the computer. It sounds absolutely fantastic. And sounds like uh, I'm sure it was insanely stressful and difficult to get to this point. But man, you guys got to be feeling really good right now to to finally be there and and get this into production. Absolutely. And I uh, appreciate your time today. If, if you and your audience need some more information, go to hpe.com slash info slash Spaceborne. And there you can get more details about Spaceborne and there will be uh, listed ways to watch the launch and participate in my excitement. Yeah, well, good. All right. Well, we'll put the link in the, uh, the notes in the description and, uh, uh, Absolutely fantastic. Thanks for your time. And uh, for everyone else, thanks for tuning in. Thank you.